Hey everyone, I'm Harrison and before we get into the chess, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and my channel. I'm currently an undergrad student at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, you may know me as the guy who tried to do 20,000 tactics in one sitting because that's something I recently tried to do. Uh, I'm a chess expert and lifelong chess player and in high school I taught at a chess club called Chess for Life for two years. Uh, but around four months ago, I decided I wanted to really dedicate myself to the game. So I'm currently actively working toward the National Master USCF title. Uh, and around three weeks ago, I decided to start a chess YouTube channel since making a successful YouTube channel has always uh, also been one of my life goals. Um, on screen now are all of the videos I've made so far, but I plan on uploading as often as possible, most likely at least one video per day. Um, I try to make my videos in a way so that they're both instructive and entertaining to chess players of all skill levels, at least below the master level. Uh, some of my videos are more directed at beginners, but I try to make most of my videos applicable to chess players of all skill levels, beginner, intermediate, uh, advanced, uh, or expert. So if you like chess content that is both instructive and entertaining, uh, then I'd appreciate it if you could check out my channel. Uh, I also plan on doing some fun IRL chess videos once my channel gets a little bigger, so I'm not going to reveal exactly what I have planned for that right now, but it's going to be a lot of fun, so uh, stay tuned for that. Um, also an announcement, once I reach 500 subscribers, I will be signing and giving away a chess set, so I'll release a video with more details about that once I reach 500 subscribers. Um, the signature probably isn't going to be worth much, at least right now, but uh, I hope that one day it is, and if it isn't, then... Uh, at least you have a free chess set. So, um, And another announcement, once I reach 1,000 subscribers, I will be doing a cosplay of Agad Mator, where I will disguise myself as Antonio and do a video in his style. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. And now that you know about me, I will show you uh, what one of my videos looks like. And so I'm just going to make a video how I normally would and try to ignore the fact that probably a thousand times the number of people will be watching this video compared to uh, how many people normally watch my videos. So without further ado, let's get right into the chess. Um, today, I'm going to be showing you an opening, which this is probably my favorite um, Sicilian variation opening. I, I don't play the Sicilian as black, but um, th this line is just so sharp and forcing and, um, and tactical that um, I, I think everyone should be familiar with this line because um, I, I really have a philosophy that if you can understand openings well, then the rest of your chess will also be really, uh, it, it will improve. Because openings, if you think about it, we know how to play perfectly or close to perfectly in the opening. So if you can understand uh, the ideas in the openings, you know, why certain moves are being played in the openings, then that power will translate to uh, the rest of your chess game. So I, I think openings are really... A powerful tool to learn, um, especially if you're going from like uh, beginner to intermediate or intermediate to advanced. I, actually, at all at all chess levels, really, uh, openings are good to learn. It's always good to be learning uh, more openings. So I'm just going to showcase this pin variation, um, which, like I said, is my favorite Sicilian variation. So it starts off with e4, c5, knight f3. So white goes for the open Sicilian, and e6, black does the French Sicilian in response. Um, and here white plays d4, so just continuing the main line, c cross d4, knight cross d4, and this is all standard uh, Sicilian stuff. This is this is um, this position has occurred many many times. And here black has a couple of choices. They can play a6, which leads into the Sicilian con variation. Uh, they can play knight c6, which leads into the Sicilian Paulson variation. Um, but in the pin variation, black plays knight to uh, f6, um, and here. White also has a few choices. Well, they don't really have a choice, but they, they've had a few. They have a few moves that they've tried. So I'm going to be uh, starting with the worst move here, which is e5. So on this previous move, Black's knight was attacking this e4 pawn. So uh, we've got to do something about it. We have three options. The first is to move the pawn. So Black can't take the pawn if we moved it off the square. However, this is a huge blunder because Black simply plays queen a5. Uh, this is a fork on the king and the pawn. So uh, there's no way white can defend this. Black is going to win a pawn here, and um, this is just going to be very good for black. Uh, so white cannot play e5 in this position. Uh, another move that has been tried is bishop d3. Um, however, this line is considered kind of an inaccuracy for white because after the following sequence, knight c6, uh, white doesn't want to trade, uh, uh, excuse me, white does not want to move the knight back because uh, they've already moved the knight a couple of times. So here, 
uh, they have to trade. So knight cross c6 and b cross d6. And now black has very good control over the d5 square, which is a luxury that they often don't get in the Sicilian. Um, and after castles and d5, for example, uh, this position is considered equal at worst to favorable at best for black. So uh, white often avoids playing uh, five bishop d3 uh, for this reason, uh, for that line. So um, bishop d3, not really the most accurate move. Uh, really, the only uh, accurate move that white can play here is going to be knight c3. And once again, black has a few choices. So um, uh, if they play, if black plays knight c6 here, this leads into the four knights Sicilian. Uh, black can also play d6, uh, and this allows white to play g4, which leads to the ultra sharp Sicil Sicilian Shevenigan variation, um, which this is another really fun Sicilian variation. Both sides should be pretty well prepared to play into this line. Um, and this this line pro uh, probably deserves a video of its own, so I'll probably be making a video about this line later on. Uh, but in the pin variation, uh, black plays bishop b4, and this is the pin. This is the pin that it, the pin variation is named for. Uh, so we've got a lot of errors here. With this knight on c3 pinned here, uh, black is now threatening to take this e4 pawn, so white has tried a couple different moves uh, to defend it. So let's look at the worst one first, which is uh, bishop g5. So the idea here is now the knight is pinned and they're not going to be able to take this pawn since if black takes, then white will win the queen. Uh, however, this is a blunder because after bishop cross c3, b cross c3, and queen a5, it's a fork on the pawn and the bishop. And also, now that the queen is no longer, uh, no, now that the knight is no longer pinned to the queen, the knight is now also threatening to take this e4 pawn here. So black just has too many threats. Most white players here play bishop cross f6, and after queen cross c3 check and king e2, uh, g cross f6, uh, black is going to be up a pawn, and it's going to take a long time for white to develop and make their king safe. So this is just one way that white can go wrong in the pin variation. Um, and so for, for this reason, white cannot play bishop g5. Uh, that's really the only blunder move that has been played here, but there have been a, a few inaccurate moves that have been played here. So let's look at uh, f3. This kind of just leads to some positional weaknesses uh, later on in the game, which is why it's considered not very accurate. So if we just follow a very forcing line here, um, d5 and e5, knight fd7 attacking the pawn. So white plays f4 to defend it. Uh, knight c6 and bishop e3 uh, and queen a5, knight b3, bishop cross c3 check, b cross c3, and queen cross c3, um, just following some common database lines and engine moves. Um, bishop d2 and queen b2, white will be down a pawn, uh, but black's queen is out of play. Uh, also, this g1 to a7 diagonal is going to be very weak for white, so they're going to need to spend some extra time safeguarding their king. Um, this line is probably playable for white, but they're probably going to need to be very prepared and they should be extra careful um, before going into it. So it, it's just not a very pleasant position to play as white. This is this is the line. This is like the most common line um, after white plays f3. So it, it's just not a great position for white, which is why it's not considered uh, the best move, though probably a lot of Sicilian players play it because you can actually play f3 in a lot of Sicilian variations. Um, so let's look at the second inaccurate move now, which is uh, bishop to d3. However, after d6 and both sides castle, um, actually, the reason why black played d6 here is to prevent e5. So um, this pawn is going to be stuck on e4. This bishop is going to be blocked uh, behind the pawn. So after both players castle, uh, this is playable. White's bishop is going to be stuck babysitting this pawn. Uh, because it's attacked by the knight. The pawn can never move. The bishops might not be active, or this light square bishop is, might not be active for a while. Um, and black can double white's c pawns uh, anytime that they would like. Um, so w once again, this line is probably playable, but it's not as strong as the main line, which is after bishop b4, white plays e5. And so this is the main line pin variation from white. Uh, and here, black, so the knight is attacked, obviously. Um, Black has tried two moves. One of them is a mistake, uh, which we'll take a look at that right now. It's knight e4. 
Uh, and you, you might think like, okay, what's the difference between knight e4 and knight d5? Like they kind of look like the same move. Um, they're both pressuring this knight, getting the knight out, out of harm's way. Um, like what's the difference? And the difference is you might think, okay, black's threatening to take twice here and uh, fork a king, king in the rook. So we have to defend with queen d3 or bishop d2. However, the main line move, the best move here for white as well is queen to g4. And this is a fork on the knight in the g-pawn. So you might be thinking, like, why can't black just take twice here and it forks the king in the rook and black's going to win a rook? Like, th how can this be good for white? Uh, however, this it, it, it gets complicated. You, you'll have to see. So knight cross c3, black is really hoping that white takes here and, uh, and black gets the fork on the king in the rook. So uh, white is not going to do that because white does not want to get forked. So instead, they play queen takes g7. Now, white is attacking black's rook. So you might think, okay, we didn't take this knight, and we, if we move this knight, it's going to be check. White won't have time to take our rook, so we can save our piece uh, as black. Um, however, this doesn't actually work because we can just play c3, and black still has two pieces hanging, so white's going to win back uh, one of their pieces after like rook f8 and uh, um, c cross b4, for example. And um, So that, that's going to be good for white. So you can't actually save your piece here. Um, so... For that reason, knight e4 is, is not very commonly played. Uh, instead, black plays rook to f8. Once again, we do not want to capture here as white because that will get us forked. So you might be thinking, how do we get out of this? How do we get our piece back? We can't capture. The answer is you play a3. Um, and so the idea here is now uh, two black pieces are hanging, and um, we're going to kick this bishop away from the defense of the knight. And once that happens, we can take the knight. Um, and not get forked. And, and if the knight moves, then we just take the bishop. But wait a minute, because if the knight moves to e5, we just take the bishop, it's all good. However, black can move the knight to b5. And we're attacking white's knight, we're also attacking the king, so black's going to be up a piece in the end. a cross b4, knight cross d4, and black's up a piece. So what's the deal for white? However, it keeps going. This is why I love this line, because this knight e5 move is is a mistake for this whole line. We're not even done yet. Um, and th this is why I just love opening so much because here, white can win back their piece, believe it or not, with the move, not bishop h6, but bishop g5. And the idea here is we want to kick black's queen away uh, from being able to defend this rook. So uh, if we immediately went bishop h6, for example, excuse me, uh, black can simply play queen e7 and, you know, it's it's all fine. Um, so first we play bishop g5. Uh, black can't play queen c7, for example, because then we just go bishop h6 and there's no way to defend this rook, so black is going to be uh, in deep water here. Um, so here black has to play queen b6. And now we play bishop h6. Black plays queen takes b4 check. Uh, so white sacrifices this pawn, and now we play c3. Uh, so this taking this pawn was the only way to defend this rook. However, it allows us to fork uh, black's queen and knight with c3. Um, so here if black plays, now if black plays queen e7, we can simply take this knight, and um, it's going to be fine for white. It's going to be fine for position for white uh, here. So queen e7 is not considered the strongest move. Instead, this move, knight f5, counter-attacking white's queen. So the idea is if if white takes black's queen, black is going to take our queen. Um, so what, white could win the exchange here by taking on f8, but stronger is c cross b4 and knight cross g7, bishop cross g7, because now instead of winning the exchange, we just win the knight. Usually it's better to win a full piece rather than to win an exchange. Uh, and bishop g8 and, excuse me, rook g8 and bishop f6, um, and this is the end of our line. So let's take a look uh, here. White's, white has the bishop pair and an advanced e-pawn, which is going to be a major asset in the middle game and end game. Uh, also, black is never going to castle this game because this rook has moved and um, uh, this bishop is preventing black from castling queenside. Uh, and white has the open a-file, c-file, and d-file. So despite the double b-pawns, this position is considered uh, positionally overwhelming overwhelming for white.
So that's the line that that may be one of my favorite uh, opening lines ever, just because it's it's so forcing, so tactic, uh, tactical. Um, th this mistake after ninety four um, in the pin variation. So now let's look at the correct move, which is knight d five. Um, and here, white is still going to play queen g4. Uh, black can't play knight takes c6 because it's the same position. And like we analyzed, that's not going to be good for black in the end. Uh, so white is attacking this g-pawn here. Black has a couple ways to defend it. Obviously, they could bring their bishop back, but that, that they're not going to do that. That's not a good idea to undevelop a piece and prevent black from castling. So here, black has tried three moves. Uh, the first, and in my opinion, the worst, is g6. So... This line allows black to maintain material equality, which we will say is not the case in an, in uh, the castle's line. But I wouldn't advise this line because black's king is probably going to be stuck in the center of the board. Um, you can't castle queenside because of the missing c pawn, uh, and it's it's hard to be it's going to be hard to castle kingside because of all of these dark squared weaknesses. It's probably more dangerous to castle kingside than it is to castle queenside. Um, so. Black is going to have a hard time keeping their king safe after this, so I wouldn't go for g6, though people have played it. Uh, the second move is king f8, so it, you're, you're just defending the g-pawn with your king. You're probably going to have to develop your rook with, say, h5 and rook h6 later in the game, and this bishop is probably, you're going to want to probably keep it around to stick on this diagonal uh, to defend your king later in the game. Uh, so once again, some people like playing like this. Um, but I personally wouldn't go for it. The main move, most popular move, and also my recommendation uh, for black if you get this position as black is to castle. Um, however, this allows white to win the exchange. So after bishop h6, there's a mate threat on g7. Black cannot defend this pawn. The only way to defend is to play g6, and this allows white to simply win an exchange after bishop cross f8 and queen cross f8. Uh, so now, this is, this is kind of the mainline pin variation uh, this is at least the end of end of the theory that I know, or I would recommend. Really, anyone needs to know. Um, you really don't need to know the pin variation theory farther than this point. Um, so let's take a look at the imbalances. Black has the bishop pair, uh, but white is up the exchange. Black's king is safe, but white still needs to castle. Uh, black has these dark squared weaknesses around his king, but it's going to be hard for white to capitalize on these because uh, there's no longer a dark squared bishop for white. Um, and uh, going off of that, uh, black has all these pawns on light squares, which is going to be a strong counter to white's light squared bishop. Um, so white's light squared bishop is just going to be uh, much less effective um, with all these pawns on uh, light squares in the middle game. Uh, so overall, this is playable from both sides, but I would consider white to be slightly better here. And um, that's what most players agree on as well. Um, and that is the pin variation. I don't think I have anything else to say about that. So uh, shout out to Antonio for doing this. This is this excellent subscribers. Uh, Chess Hub Showcase has been a great idea from him. And uh, be sure to check out my channel. Once again, I've got those two special things going on at 500 subs and 1,000 subs. And uh, I have a Discord too. So if you join my Discord, you can get notifications whenever I go live on Twitch or uh, upload a new chess video. So be sure to join that too. And um, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say. So thank you for watching. Thank you, Antonio. And um, I'll see you next time.